Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you all for attending this talk and a big thank you to the PlatformCon uh, staff for uh, putting this on and making this making this possible. I'm really excited to, uh, to be a part of it and to be giving uh, this talk on automating adoption, uh, which has been awesome for our team and I hope it is for yours. Um, so diving right in, a little bit about me. My name is John Patterson. Uh, I'm a network guy turned into ops person turned into a DevOps practitioner, turned into a full Java developer, and now I'm back doing what I love, which is creating tooling for devs on the DX team. Um, I work at SageSure, which is a homeowner's insurance company, for those of you not familiar. Um, and I've been here for eight, running coming on eight years now. Um, and our software, uh, our software group is comprised of over 100 people spread across 10 different teams. Um, working on 80 plus microservices. We're all remote. Um, and uh, some of our values, this is important just because it influences um, how we've designed this tool that I'll be talking about. Um, uh, we value code ownership, autonomy, and quality of life. And as an aside, we are hiring uh, on hiring on the DX team and we have multiple positions open in this, on our software team. So if you or someone you know uh, is looking for a job, please drop me a line directly or you can browse. I've added the link here. Um, and see the open positions we have. We would love to get in contact with you. So next, what are scorecards? Um, as I was creating this presentation, I was trying to figure out, um, are there examples in our daily life that we can draw upon for scorecards? And um, there are, it's, it's the only one I could think of is putt-putt. <laughs> um, there probably are better examples, but, uh, but I think putt-putt, we'll stretch the analogy and see if it works. Uh, so we have uh, at the top here, we have each hole. So we have holes one through 18. We have uh, your score of where you measure up and then there's an expectation par, which is two strokes per hole. That's what par is uh, with a five stroke limit, it says. Uh, and then finally, we have the grand total. Um, so this is kind of uh, it's it's interesting. We see what we should be doing. We're able to measure how we are actually doing. Um, and then kind of extrapolating, not to belabor the point too much, but um, what are scorecards after looking at that? Um, they measure things we care about. They measure, uh, they, they provide a feedback loop. So we are able to know how we're doing um, uh, uh, based off of what's expected. It's uh, a way to communicate what uh, expectations as well. Um, they also identify areas for improvement. So for example, say we're we're doing all we're always you know three over par so we got five strokes on hole number six well we need to practice hole number six it's pretty clear um uh but again i'll drop the putt putt analogy i think it's i think we've run its course um ooh, that's a good pun all right <clears throat> so here's what scorecards look like in uh in more as it relates to software here we have a code quality uh, this is something we're probably all familiar with where um we can see here uh kind of where this project stands. It's got an A on bugs, uh, vulnerabilities, and code smells. But we can it's telling us how we're doing, but it's also showing us areas that we can improve. So if you look here, it's pretty obvious that we can invest more time into reviewing hotspots and get a better grade. Um, same thing for unit test coverage. If we want to have a better, um, a, a better score here, we could just in, um, invest more time uh, in, in creating unit tests. So we wanted to know, can we do the same thing for the platform? We're always making changes and adding new capabilities. How are we able to track that those things are actually being used? And how, do, how are we able to communicate with developers so that they know um, of the cool things that we're doing? They, they know, hey, it looks like you're using this old deployment pattern. Uh, you really should be using this new one. Um, did you realize that that's available to you? Did you, uh, you know, uh, how do we surface that information for them? And this is where NATO comes in. Um, it's a terrible name. Uh, I created it because I'm terrible at naming things. I'm terrible at naming projects. Um, but it stands for increased adoption. It's a Python project we wrote in-house. And uh, the, the basic mechanics of it are every night it clones um, every repo in, uh, inside our version control system <clears throat> and then runs a collection of, of checks. Um, checks are just custom bits of code that collect information about a project and return a value. Um, uh, this, this could all, this could be, uh, your code coverage percent. Um, it, it could be a, a Boolean, it could be any type of value, but we call these return values facts. 
Uh, we persist these facts inside of a database um, in a time, kind of time series way, uh, but not probably as quick as, uh, uh, or, or not as, um, as high of a frequency as like Prometheus or something like that. Um, and then finally, we uh, have this remediation step, uh, which is optional. And this will just make the, uh, make the project compliant with the check. Uh, we'll get more into this because this has to deal with the automating part of our talk. We'll get more into that later. So a little bit more about a check. Let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, it's just made up of this metadata, which includes the name of the check, the description about the check, short code, uh, which is an easy way to refer to it. And, um, and then there's the, there's the other side, which is the runtime components. Uh, these methods is eligible run and remediate. Uh, this is a little bit of pseudo cut, pseudo code about those last three methods. So is eligible is just testing to see if a check should be run against the project. Um, it will return true if the check, if the run method should, um, should be uh, executed and false if not. In this case, we're just checking for a GitLab CI file, uh, YAML file at the root of the project repo um, and we'll return the result. The run method is responsible for generating our fact value. Um, here we see, <laughs> here we see uh, it's just checking to see if CD enabled, if that, uh, if that value is found inside the file contents. Um, and then it's going to return. Optionally, we have this remediate step, like I was saying. Um, this will, you can do all sorts of things in here. Um, you can change the code to make it compliant with the check. Um, so in this case, we could just throw CD enabled that value inside of the file contents and push it up, uh, either make a, you know, commit straight to master or, you know, let's make an MR probably. Um, but you, uh, you can do anything like, uh, I think another example that we've used is calling, um, uh, Grafana APIs to create a dashboard for, uh, for the service. Um, but really the sky's the limit there. A couple of examples of checks that we've created, uh, are unit test coverage, which I've talked about. Um, paved road partial usage. So if, uh, if a service is using our, our paved road uh, uh, CI partials, um, sonar cube ratings, uh, testing for open API specs that, that each service has an open API spec defined, that each service has an SLO, each deployable service has an SLO, um, that there's alerts enabled. Um, and, uh, and if we're using Kubernetes for the deployment or like uh, an, old, uh, an old deployment methodology. And you'll see here that uh, a lot of the services, a lot of these checks um, uh, are returning Boolean facts, uh, fact values. Um, that's just a, that's just something that we've, um, uh, that we kind of gravitate towards. Um, it's certainly not the rule. You can return any type of value, um, but uh, that's just kind of a pattern that we've, uh, that we've started to, to notice. Um, and once you kind of have this framework in place, you'd be surprised at how many things that you can come up, uh, uh, how many different use cases you can come up for uh, with, with checks. So you can create a check for really just about anything. Um, but the whole idea is to try to either track information, get some metrics about usage for yourself um, or for your team uh, or for the service owners. So to help signal to them, hey, this is, uh, really an area that you should invest a little bit more time into. Um, so it kind of works both ways. Um, let's walk through an example. So a couple of years ago, we, we uh, began the hard work of, um, of fighting for continuous uh, delivery um, in, inside of our organization. Uh, and we, we spent a lot of time educating, uh, educating folks, getting buy-in. And finally, we added the platform capability and then we were asked, well, hey, how's that going? What's the adoption look like? That's a fantastic question. We didn't really have any answers. And so we created a check for it. So we wanted to know how many services are deploying continuously. Um, how many uh, services should be? Again, look, thinking back to that is eligible. Um, uh, and, and how do we actually know if people are using this capability? Um, so our check kind of resembled um, the pseudo code here where we look to see if, uh, if this service had, uh, was had Kubernetes deployment automation. Um, and if it, if it did, then it was eligible. And then we check to see if this key existed inside of one of these, in one of these files, CD enabled. 
And if it existed, then great. Um, it's a very, again, it's a little bit of pseudocode. The actual check uh, goes into a little bit more detail. Um, and finally, uh, you'll notice that the remediate um, method is blank. Um, this is an example of where we don't want to have, um, we don't want to make a decision on the service owner's behalf uh, because it really involves a lot more thinking through about how your service actually runs and deploys. Um, so we like to add a little bit of review for this check specifically. But it goes to show you that not every single check should have a remediate uh, step. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's a, it, this is a um, version one of our, uh, of our scorecard. Um, <clears throat> and we, uh, it's not pictured here as we have rows and rows and rows of all of our checks. Um, and you can filter by team, you can filter by service. Um, so a team can use this to, to go and say, hey, where are we at with our, um, we keep getting asked, like how many of our services are, C, are um, uh, CD enabled? Um, well, here you can see that five out of, your, five out of the eight of your services um, are uh, CD enabled and where to apply extra effort um, to get the, uh, which services need, need, um, uh, need to be enabled. So <clears throat> you can do this for, again, for all of our checks. This is all just through Grafana. Um, and we also have a separate panel that, that shows uh, the history. So we can actually chart um, over time um, the effect values and see our adoption rates grow. It's really kind of, uh, really kind of cool stuff. But version one, um, we'll kind of show you what version, give a little sneak preview about version two in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> another example is backstage job adoption. This is one that's um, more recent for me. Uh, we decided to use Backstage for our service catalog. We had been using it for a couple of other things, but we decided to go all in on Backstage. Um, and we wanted to know how quickly can we onboard, onboard all 80 services into the Backstage catalog. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, without NATO, it's, it's kind of a feat. Uh, it's, or it's kind of a daunting task to just think of onboarding all of these service and, services and getting uh, service owners to do this work. Um, but Sidestepping that for a moment, um, for those of you unfamiliar with Backstage, this is what it looks like. Um, you have this component view for a service, and here you'll see a little bit of more, a little bit of information about that service, um, including um, the SonarQ plugin that shows the code quality uh, for that service. There's also some um, arbitrary links, um, and all of this is driven through uh, this YAML file. Um, here you'll see that there's that sonar cube uh, annotation that links to um, the sonar cube value. It has to be in a very specific format. Um, here we can add links. We could add uh, um, specify APIs that it provides. We can also specify this, the the type of component this is, <clears throat> which in this case it's a service, but it could also be a website or it could be a um, a library. So. How do we go about all that? All that's required for us to onboard a service is just for this file to exist in the root of the repository. So how can we go about making this a reality? Well, like I said, we could create documentation, which we should probably do anyways. Um, uh, and we could just kind of ask service owners to do it. But for 80 plus services, it's a lot of work. It's pretty monotonous. Um, and I think there's a better way. Uh, we could also just do it ourselves, but then again, that's kind of getting away from the service ownership aspect um, and autonomy. We really want service. We really want to bring service owners along this journey with us. We want them to see that this is a new capability and really feel a sense of ownership over it. Um, so this is where the automating part of the talk comes into um, automating the backstage adoption. So what we did was um, we added a remediate function um, inside of our backstage check that automatically determine the component type. So if it was deployed on Kubernetes, we said it's a service. If it, if it published an artifact um, to one of our uh, artifact storage systems, then it was a uh, library. If it deployed to our CDN, well, then it's a website. Um, same thing for open API specs and user docs. Um, if, any of these, uh, if any of these files existed, we were able to craft this um, catalog info file for them and then submit it for their review. And here's an example of MR uh, that <clears throat> that NATO created. Um, here you, you can also see that we provide a little bit of context about the change that we're making, including it's, it's all sorts of docs, um, how they can uh, contact us for additional questions, and then anything that needs review on their part. So here you can see that, hey, you might need to take a look at the uh, owner field 
um, to make sure that's right. And they pushed a change. You can see that the commits was number two. They pushed a change and then they merged it. So, um, so what, how did this work out for us? How are we able to ado automate the adoption of Backstage? Well, we were able to, mod uh, able to migrate all services and websites within a couple of weeks. Um, and most importantly, service owners drove the adoption. Um, it wasn't us just doing the grunt work. You know, we took, um, we took this two weeks includes creating the check for it and testing it. And then the rest was up to the service owners um, and hats off to them. Uh, so kind of in summary, checks and scorecards can encode and communicate best practices. Uh, they can encourage and, auto, uh, and automate adoption. Um, they're useful for tracking um, uh, platform usage of platform components, and they reinforce service ownership and autonomy. Um, so in the future, <clears throat> what we're hoping to do with NATO is um, dive deeper into the language stack and create uh, analyzed patterns and paradigms. If you haven't seen Open Rewrite, definitely go check it out. It's such a cool project. Uh, has a lot of promise for us uh, with NATO, so we could say, hey, you might be using this old version of, let's say, uh, Spring Boot. Um, here's this new version, and here's what it takes to migrate to that new version. It's all all automated, all encoded. Um, another feature plan is to uh, have better project detection and categorization. So you have Linguist. GitHub has Linguist to detect the de types of languages that are being used in a project. Uh, we want to do the same thing like hey this is a java service that's deployed on kubernetes or hey this is a go library um, do all that for the check so not every check has to reinvent the wheel um, and finally we want to integrate with backstage tech insights plugin um, I, as i mentioned <coughs> our scorecard is currently a grafana uh, dashboard uh, we want to put that right next to uh, the service um, uh, the service component view inside of backstage that i showed earlier um, and we can do that through this plugin uh, built by roadie um, and here you can see an example of what that might look like. Um, so in summary, yeah, this is, uh, we've had, a, we've seen a lot of benefit from scorecards and, uh, we're hoping to do more with them. Um, if you have any questions at all, uh, please reach out to me over, uh, over email. I'm, um, absent on, uh, social media. Um, but, but yeah, I would love to, love to hear from you. Um, and thank you all for attending this, this talk.